I want to continue the conversation with a small contribution and suggest that our focus that where we heard about from Vicky and Colin and indeed from other people about the importance of considering construction, making, as part of what people were doing in terms of using large stone, using megaliths to make monuments, is very important. And that we should think about it at the human scale, in terms of how people work stone, and also to consider that alongside the very careful use, selected use, as we've seen in many examples here in another colloquia, in terms of both local stone, but also choosing different stones, combining them together, in terms of color difference, texture difference, people are aware and showing awareness of a very active um, appreciation of and selection of stone, that this is important to put in the context of the other materials that we see in use at megalithic sites. And again, colleagues have drawn refer made, made reference to this, the small things, the small stone, the turf, the soil, that all of these things have to be considered alongside the megaliths. And that the linking action between the megaliths and those small things is what people do. They work them, and they work them at a human scale to make something bigger. Somebody mentioned this morning the notion of cumulative architecture. Well, this is, in effect, what we see at megaliths. And I want to suggest that this is important because it makes us realize that while megaliths are special, that if we think about this idea of working at, at the hand scale, at the human scale, and what people are doing at megaliths, allows us to link in to other areas of the lives that people lived. And that this is very important because it reminds us, for example, that the use of objects and the working of objects can be related to the use, construction of monuments, and that the digging of pits can be at a big scale, as we've heard, or it can be at a little scale. And that these notions of overlapping spheres of reference are actually held in people's heads as they're making megaliths. So I want to make three points, very simply, based on three premises, and perhaps these should be, have a question mark rather than an assumption built into them. Firstly, that stone was not just a neutral background, but was vital, alive, and that that's how people viewed it. Secondly, that we need to remember this notion of small-scale stone, small-scale action, as a reference to what people were doing with the large stone as well. And that from recent work that I've been doing, looking at, at in some cases, long published sites, I would like to argue that, at least in some cases, in Irish megalithic terms, that part of the process of constructing a megalith was actually incorporating human remains uh, into, the, into the stone to make that stone more vital, more alive, more ancestral, bigger. This use of stone we've seen, and, and Vicky and Colin have talked about it already, but it, it, it can take a number of different forms. We've seen this example. This is a, a dolmen at Carrie Glass, where this limestone um, slab has been, has been raised up. That's one version. We can also think of this not just as a celebration or a lifting of the stone, but also as an opening out of an outcrop. And this is an, a sm much smaller portal dolmen or portal tomb. And here, the rock outcrop has been split apart so that the framed part is a megalith 
and the rest is the surviving part of the outcrop. And together, they make a whole. This is uh, Harristown in, in Southern Ireland, and here a, a late passage term built after 3000 BC in the, of a form that's a late in, the, in, the, in its architectural form. But what I want to talk about is its very distinctive location on a prominent local landmark that can be seen from a wide distance, and where it would appear that all the stones from the, from the, in the monument come from the immediate vicinity of the top of the hill, and that there's a clear relationship between the outcrop and the stone that's used. So these are all examples of where people have perhaps gone to places and built megaliths because of the stone. And that's not in any way ruling out a functional use of stone, but it's saying it has this other dimension as well. And that in some cases it may relate to particular properties of the stone. For example, in this case, the large quartz or white clasts that are in this, this local sandstone. There are other examples, uh, and most notably in the Boyne Valley, where the stone is brought to a location. We, we don't know how widespread a phenomenon this is in the Irish Neolithic, but it certainly is a case, a, a landmark of uh, the, the developed passage tombs like Newgrange, Nowth, and Douth in the Boyne Valley. And we'll hear more about this in the papers after this one. The major source appears to be a sandstone, a grey wacky, coming from uh, Clara Head, highlighted there in the photograph in terms of a geological map. And at Clara Head, we can see both areas where orthostatic slabs are generated by erosion processes of this gray, of this gray wacky, but also where there appear to be potential quarry areas. I should say that the focus on this site to date has been geological, that no detailed archaeological fieldwork has been carried out to date on this very important site. The issue of the location of this uh, quarry site is also, I, I think, very significant, but if you like, a topic for another day. But this, I think it does relate to this idea of a headland that has wide visibility to the north and to the south along the Irish Sea coast, and that it's surrounded by a soft coastline, and that in either direction as well you can see passage tombs. So that there are these natural places that take on a significance, and that in this case, the, uh, it was so important that the, the stone from this area was incorporated and transported 20, 25 kilometers and brought to the Boyne Valley. And that, in a sense, brings us to the, the second point I want to talk about, which is this notion of small-scale stone and small-scale action. Um, and, and as I say, to, to emphasize that I'm talking this morning on a, on a symbolic front, but this, I, I accept entirely that there's a functional aspect to this as well. My query would be, I think that we sometimes either talk functionally or we talk symbolically, and perhaps we need to do both. And in the case of um, this kind of working of stone on, on site, I suspect that we tend to assume a kind of functionality to this. In a case like Anok Mar here, where a local outcrop is used and quarried and the, and, the, and the monument is built immediately adjacent to it. And in our heads, we might say immediately assume, well, this is just functional use of an available local source. I would say two things here. One, that I think we need to remember that much of the cairn material that you see here is quarried locally and is also part, some of it is spalls and uh, pieces and debitage, if you like, from the working of the large stones. And that that process of construction, if, if this used, uh, Colin has used this phrase expedient, that that, that I think was actually very important, the, the creation of this monument from a local rock outcrop was actually a tremendously important act. And that may have been what was important rather than the long-term history of the monument. I think that becomes much more apparent if we can, in the case of the Boyne Valley, think about the fact 
that a non-local source is being used, both for the grey wacky down here and also these, the quartz and the, and the cobbles in this face at Newgrange that will be fam familiar to many of you, that all of this has been brought into this area. And I think this notion that I'm suggesting of the importance of working, of, of working the stone as part of what people were doing at these monuments is illustrated by the fact that I would argue that that notion of working is incorporated to a much greater extent than we perhaps we've recognised in actually the form and structure of the large monuments in the Boyne Valley. This is a, a detail of that area up there. This is often described as decorative, a decorative facade. And, and of course the big argument, as we know, is about whether it would have stood like that in the Neolithic. But that's another story. But what's interesting is that I recorded, looked at a hundred of these cobbles in, in the facade, and uh, at least 25 of them have abraded ends in that random sample, as you can see. So these are functional artifacts. And here we have a, an interesting, um, if you like, reversal of the normal thing. We've, we've, we've put the emphasis on the ceremonial of, uh, part of the symbolic role of these objects. And we've kind of forgotten that these are actually functional objects, cobblestones, hammerstones, large hammerstones, to work other materials on site. And we can spot examples of exactly the same material at Clower Head, just on a, on a field visit, suggesting that there is this relationship between the two processes going on. When we go back to the Boyne Valley, we can actually see evidence for working grey wacky, both at Newgrange and at Nouth in different ways. For example, in, the, in, in a Newgrange corbel, in the setting outside, one of the several settings outside Nouth, that there are in that setting spalls from the grey wacky that have been incorporated into the monument. And I would like to suggest, and I suppose this again comes with a question mark, that this is deliberate, that this isn't just debitage that's thrown to one side, and that the function and the main focus is on the megabits. If we accept that this stone is important, then we, I think, should also at least begin to raise the question of whether this debitage was also important to people. And I'd like to expand that argument by looking at two of the small sites at Nouth. And this is site 18, and as you can see here, very little of the site left, but in the surviving part of what would have been one of the chambers of a small passage tomb, a spall from Greywacky has been used to cover the cremation deposit. So it, it, it's, there's a deliberate referencing here and appreciation, if you like, of this material, even though we might, if it was in another context, we just see it as a, as a, as a spall of Greywacky. More interestingly, this is site 16, and uh, it's a small tomb, and again, uh, all I want to focus on here is the idea that we can see, in, if you look at the, the burial deposits one to three, there are the photographs that you see around the top. And we can see an interdigitation of the placing down of grey wacky pieces, of, of deposits of cremated bone, of a slab of grey wacky, of more deposits of cremated bone, of more grey wacky. So there's this interplay between the, the construction, if you like, of this and the placement of cremated material. And I, I take two things from this, again with question marks that perhaps we could come back to. But firstly, this, these, these spalls of grey wacky, the, the little pieces, are important and are being used in a very deliberate way. And secondly, that the cremated bone is actually going in right from the start, and that it's part of the process by which people are making the monument. And that brings me to my final premise or question. Um, I suppose to phrase it as a question, were the bones of the selected dead, in some cases, deliberately incorporated into the monument, rather than being the placement of burial deposits. 
And I want to suggest that this is the case and that we, when we look at a range of Irish sites, published sites, that we can see this to be true. Palnebron is an example of a big dolmen. Um, it's on the, on, on the Burren. It's got an extensive series of radiocarbon dates. But what's of interest from my premise, if you like, is that much of the bone has been deliberately pushed down into the cracks of the grikes of the limestone pavement that form the floor of this chamber. So it's been deliberately put back into the rock. The mound of the hostages has been mentioned by uh, Chris yesterday. And he mentioned this point that there is the, the cairn that covers the monument, this debate about whether there may be a time interval between those two events. But he also mentioned that there are a number of, of burials around the perimeter of the cairn on the mound. That's the location of the photograph that we saw the last time. And that's the location of the, of the burial chamber with the cysts beside it that, again, Chris mentioned yesterday. The burials are interesting in that their radiocarbon dates and their stratigraphic relationship with the main mound suggest that they are contemporary with the construction of the chamber and the burials in the cysts. I've, I've, I've described them here as mini cairns. And I think, again, we, we can visualize this notion that this is something that one person could construct in a day, in, a half, in an hour, in half an hour. But the materials that are used are exactly those that go into the making of the chamber and the cairn. And that, of course, what we're seeing there is cumulative architecture of the kinds of acts that we're seeing here being combined together in the kind of frameworks that we've heard about this morning. I'd also draw your attention. This, which is a spall from one of the, or the larger orthostats in the chamber, being used to cover one of these perimeter burials. So there are all sorts of referencing being made. And of course, this cremated bone mixed up with the stone as well. And now we come to the, the cysts, and this is uh, cyst one. And what's interesting here, I think, is that we can, um, I, I would like to suggest that what we're seeing is that as part of the construction of the chamber, that this, these deposits of human bone, they're, they're of selected individuals. They, they contain deliberately small deposits of unburnt children's bones. So there's a care about what people are doing with these that links them with the main deposits in the, in the, in the, in the chamber itself. But that here, I would argue that their purpose is really to be incorporated into this structure. And that, in effect, they become, when they're surrounded by stone, they actually have become part of that monument. And that that's what gives it its power, whether it was either freestanding for a while and then incorporated within a cairn. Um, just east of Tara, a place called Fornox, hilltop location. Some of you may know this site, which is the, what's called the Passage Tomb at Fornox, but about 50 meters to the east of it, there's a second monument which hasn't been reconstructed after the excavation campaign here in the 1950s, where both sites were excavated. And I think they have to be considered together, and they relate to the theme and the final point I want to make. The passage tomb has burial deposits in the chamber, in the three chambers off this unusually unusual central area, and in the passage as well. The deposits in the chamber are a classic, they're a very good example of what we have in passage tombs in Ireland, cremated deposits, communal deposits, covered by stone, and more deposits over that. So these look like something we, we, we might expect, but also this very interesting point about them being interweave, interwoven with the small stone. The deposits in the passage are different in that here the deposits go right from the start and before some of those orthostats in the passage were, were put in place, 
in the sockets, there were cremated bone deposits put in first. And that sequence continues where um, the passage obviously gradually goes out of use, or at some stage a decision is made to seal this monument, and, and there are a series of bone deposits and stone deposits that eventually seal up the tomb. So here we have an example of where the material has actually been used right through the history, and in fact it's telling us about the closure of the monument as well. At 50 metres to the east is Fornox II, and here in the first phase there's this unusual example of a, 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 a cremation trench, which then becomes incorporated into this pastiche megalith, where a passage is built into this cremation trench, it's covered by a mound, but in fact the passage leads nowhere, because the, 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 the trench at this stage has been filled. But the passage is filled with blocking deposits of human remains. And the first action, of course, at, at, this, at, at this site was the cremation activity in the trench. So again, this is a monument that's intimately connected and created through the treatment of human remains. So human remains aren't being placed here, or well, they are being placed, but they're actually about history being created and the, how the monument changes over time. So there's the reconstructed passage tomb in the background, and the location and what the, what the, the, the mound might have looked like if it had been reconstructed over this false entrance into it. So I'm suggesting here then that at Fornox, that the dead were actually part of the fabric of the tomb. And perhaps this is a question that we might consider more widely. Thank you very much.